The fifteenth day we had again sight of land. Near this cape we came to fathom anchor in fifteen fathoms, where we took a great store of codfish, for which we altered the name and called it Cape Cod. Gabriel Archer, 1602. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So in 1497, what did John Cabot do? Well, John Cabot, or Giovanni Cabato, was an Italian explorer who had set sail on the bark Matthew with about 20 men, with the financial backing from Bristol merchants and a commission from King Henry VII of England. It is not certain, but probable, that he landed in what is now Cape Bonavista, Newfoundland. Like Columbus, Cabot was supposed to reach Asia. Like Columbus, he hadn't. And like Columbus, Cabot's voyage would have long-lasting consequences for Europeans and devastating ones for the original inhabitants of America. Cabot's voyage would be the basis of England's earliest claim to North America. This was a bold move for a country that was not included by the Pope in the 1494 Treaty of Tordesillas, which divided the non-Christian world in half between the Spanish and Portuguese kingdoms. But bold moves came naturally for a king that picked up his crown, after all, from the defeated Richard III on Bosworth Field in 1485. As long as Henry VII remained king, England continued to explore America. John Cabot's son Sebastian followed in his father's footsteps and may have even reached the Chesapeake Bay. But when the king died in 1509, his son, now known as King Henry VIII, saw little reason to continue, as America to him was a financial burden and an unnecessary one. To Henry VIII, the money was better spent fighting in France as he attempted to regain lands that his ancestors had lost. It didn't work out well for him. It would be Henry's daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, that would reassert England's claim to North America. Never one to shy away from conflict like her father and grandfather, Elizabeth gave her blessing to English exploration, expanding trade markets and even privateering. Elizabeth's reign reflected the now Protestant England's mission to overtake Spain politically, economically, and spiritually. A renewed interest in North America incorporated all of these goals. We see these goals in the 1585 Ralph Lane colony and the more famous 1587 John White colony, both at Roanoke Island in what is now North Carolina. England's America was to be called Virginia in honor of their virgin queen. And it was a failure, a tragic failure. Not for the last time would the name Virginia be associated with death, disappearance, and disappointment. The disappearance of the English men, women, and children at Roanoke was a devastating blow to English colonization, but it was not a fatal one. The English would turn their attention back northward for their next attempts at colonization. In fact, the English had never really left. English, French, Basque, Portuguese, and other European nations had been fishing off the Newfoundland coast since the early 1500s. The English government encouraged and supported these fisheries, and therefore the English became the dominant European presence in that region. It is important to remember that long before Jamestown and Plymouth, Native Americans encountered, traded with, and fought against Europeans. They battled deadly European diseases and participated in European markets. They saw these newcomers as nations, not as gods, and some American Indians even learned English to the later astonishment of the pilgrims in 1620. But had those pilgrims been more aware of their own nation's history in New England, they would not have been so surprised. There were several early English attempts to settle what is now New England, but I'm going to focus on the two that have the closest connections to Jamestown, Cuddyhunk and Popham. The Cuddyhunk settlement was started by Captain Bartholomew Gosnold 
In many ways, Gosnold was typical of the Englishmen who became key players in this era of exploration and colonization. He was educated, he had legal training, he married into the gentry, he made well-connected friends such as Walter Raleigh and Richard Hacklett, he spent his youth learning the ropes, sailing and trading, and like so many others we call entrepreneurs today, he thought he could do it better. Gosnold gathered 32 men on board the bark Concord, which left the Azores on March 6, 1602. He was determined to find a faster route to the northern reaches of Virginia than previous Englishmen had. He succeeded, arriving off the coast of what is now called Kennebunk Port, Maine, on May 14th. But Gosnold and his men did not stay there. They continued farther south, arriving on May 15th, off the coast of what is now Provincetown Harbor, Massachusetts, where his partner Gabriel Archer noted they renamed Cape Cod. Then they continued even farther south and explored a large island full of wild grapes, but they did not notice any inhabitants. It was named Martha's Vineyard after Gosnold's recently deceased daughter. Further exploration brought the group to a small chain of islands known as the Elizabeth Islands, the southernmost island, called Cuttyhunk, was chosen by Gosnold as the site of their operation. They felled trees and built a small fort on an island within an island for protection. Gosnold's plan was to make money harvesting sassafras root, which was then a profitable commodity. While Gosnold and his men traded with local Native Americans at first, by June, as the Englishmen paid more attention to their own commercial business, relations with the local population soured. By June 17th, provisions began running low, and the men encouraged Gosnold and Archer to abandon their enterprise. A monument was erected in 1903, marking the spot of the settlement. The keynote speaker at the dedication was Edward Everett Hale, the nephew of the senator who made the speech at the Jamestown Church Tower in 1859, which was mentioned in the first video in this series. Also of note, both Bartholomew Gosnold and Gabriel Archer would become key figures at Jamestown in 1607. Gosnold would captain the Godspeed, but unfortunately would die on August 22nd of that year. Archer died several years later during the starving time. Both men's skeletal remains have been discovered and identified by Jamestown Rediscovery archaeologists. The Elizabethan age ended with the death of the Queen in 1603. James VI of Scotland became James I of England. It was a new era for England and a new era for English colonization. This new era of colonization would bring more commercial and sophisticated schemes. The Virginia Company was chartered in 1606 and financed by wealthy businessmen and titled lords, but there were actually two branches of the company. The one based out of London would finance the famous Jamestown settlement, while the one based out of Plymouth, England was funded by West Country traders and intended on settling in the northern part of Virginia. According to the charter, the London Company had rights to the portion of Virginia between 34 and 41 degrees north latitude, while the Plymouth Company had the rights to the land between the 38th and 45th parallel. Both companies' lands overlapped. The idea was for both companies to plant their respective colonies first, and the more successful of the two would take the land to the center. Jamestown happened to be the first colony by chance, as the Plymouth Company's first ship was captured by the Spanish in August 1606. By May 31, 1607, two weeks after the London Company settlers began to clear the land at Jamestown, two ships called the Gift of God and the Mary and John left England. They reached the Kennebec River in what is now Maine that August. This colony has come to be known as the Popham Colony, after its leader George Popham and its chief financial backer, his uncle Sir John Popham, the Lord Chief Justice of England. The settlers constructed a star-shaped fort near the river. A map drawn of it by John Hunt was later intercepted in England by the Spanish ambassador, Pedro de Juniega. A similar occurrence happened with a map of Jamestown. The Popham colony faced some of the same problems as Jamestown, a lack of crops, a cold winter, and fire which destroyed most of the provisions. Yet surprisingly, unlike Jamestown, only one colonist died, 
its leader, George Popham, on February 8th. Leadership passed to Raleigh Gilbert, the nephew of Sir Walter Raleigh. Gilbert proved a polarizing figure, but soon abandoned the Popham colony to inherit his brother's fortune. Sir John Popham had also recently died, which caused the 45 remaining colonists to abandon the settlement after only a year in America. One great achievement of Popham was the construction of the 30-ton ship Virginia, the first English-built ship in America. In 1609, Popham veteran Captain James Davis will sail this vessel and the fatal fleet which wrecked in the hurricane and caused the wreck of the Sea Venture, which we mentioned in our last video. James Davis will make it to Virginia and even survive the starving time. Another connection between Jamestown and Popham is archaeology. Both sites, Popham and James Fort, were once considered lost, and they were both rediscovered in the year 1994. As we discussed earlier, Northern Virginia will be renamed New England by Captain John Smith in 1614. Plymouth would become the first permanent English settlement in that region, 13 years after Jamestown and Popham, and 18 years after Gosnold first arrived off the coast of Maine. All of these colonies are part of a more sophisticated story of English colonization, one often obscured by a petty rivalry. And as we close this Jamestown vs. Plymouth series, I want to say not only thanks for watching, but dedicate this video to the late Fritz Mueller. He volunteered for us for many years as an archaeologist at historic Jamestown, but he'd also dug at Popham. On my first day on the job in 2012, he taught me about Popham for the first time. And Fritz, I haven't forgotten. Thank you very much.